All right. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Comic Breakdown. Today, we are talking with the uh, publishing house Pocket Watch Press, one of my favorite in indie comic publishers, independent comics. Um, you guys know we are actually talking recently about independent comics and how I want to get more of that stuff out there. I want to talk about it more. And it's just so hard because so many people want to focus on Marvel and DC when there's so many phenomenal artists, writers, creators out there doing great stuff. And that's what we're going to be getting into today because um, they are releasing a new comic that's dropping into Kickstarter, which is Rise issue number two, following a superhero who needs dopamine to be able to be superhuman, to be Superman, if you will. And so we're going to introduce both uh, Ryan and Trevor into this, and we're going to get this going. All right. Uh, let's see. There we go. Yes. Trevor, why don't you introduce yourself and then uh, pass it off to Ryan? Yeah. Uh, my name is Trevor Fernandes Lenkevich. Uh, I'm the writer and the creator of Rise, uh, Minutes to Midnight, The Hour Between Life and Death, and Area 51, The Helix Project. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm a 27 year old comic book creator based in the Northeast, of the United States, uh, who focuses on telling sort of emotional genre bender, genre bending stories to the best of his ability and, uh, who seeks uh, out to work with some of the best artistic talent in comics. And, uh, that's, you know, how we have this guy working on rise. Yeah, uh, I'm Ryan Vest. Um, I've been in comics for about 10 years now, doing pencils, inks, colors. Uh, living in North Carolina right now, uh, just a little bit north of Heroes Con. And uh, yeah, actually, this is our friend anniversary. Yeah, it's like Heroes two Con. years. Two years that we, we met at this show when I was just I was just a wee lad, you know. I was, I was just getting my start doing uh, conventions, and um, uh, I had walked past his table on the way to the bathroom. Funnily enough. And great spot. yeah, great spot. I uh, really loved his work and uh, ended up uh, commissioning a Damian Wayne Robin piece uh, to, just to kind of see like where things would go. And lo and behold, over the course of the, the next year and a half, we, we kept in touch, became friends. And uh, at, at exactly this time last year, roughly, um, we got plastered. And I was like, let me tell you this story. I have this idea. Well, you know, will it work? Can it work? And uh, how much ass can we possibly kick by doing it? And the answer was a lot. And so <laughs> a year later, here we are. Uh, issue one just came out and we're getting ready to kickstart issue two. So we're pretty stoked. Hell yeah. Um, so I don't think we really talked too much on issue one. I mean, we talked vaguely about outlines of what that is and what, what, is, what it's going to be. Now that it's out, we mm -hmm. can actually talk about it. Yeah. Um, so... So I was rereading it this morning and um, I was telling my wife about it and I was like, you know, it's a superhero that essentially needs dopamine to go be superhuman. Mm -hmm. And bro, she laughed so hard, <laughs> not, not because she thought she was just like, that's, she was like, that's literally like, that would be you. Cause I was like, the opening pages is, is him going and having a quickie with his girlfriend and then going and being superhuman. And she was like, that's literally you. She was like, if you, if you had that pro pro problem, that would literally be you. <laughs> so it made me laugh my ass off. I don't know um, if you're going to have to bleep this out, but I feel like we're just getting like the, the one sentiment we're getting out of this is that comic breakdown fucks. Like that's, <laughs> that's, that's the quote for the interview. <laughs> no, I don't worry about cussing and stuff like that. I, I cuss like a sailor, so I can't help it. Excellent. <laughs> um, no, and Ryan, you haven't been on the, the channel before, but me and Trevor have gone back and done this a bunch of times. I don't usually do typical interviews. We're just going to sit here and have a conversation. We're going to talk about the comics, your abilities, what you've contributed and stuff like that. But it's really just more of a free form, just BSing and having a good time talking about the comic. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I reread it. I went over it. And I know you can't tell me, but I have a feeling that Issa isn't going to stick around long and you know she may or may not and i know you you don't want to give anything away but i feel like for him to truly branch out and figure out what his powers are he can't have her as a constant in her his life so maybe not dead or anything of that nature but at least maybe maneuvering her out of the story a little bit more to where he has to find different avenues to get his dopamine because having a girlfriend there that's always down you know dtf that's a great, great avenue to have. 
if you have a superpower based on your dopamine. Um, but I'm really interested in exploring how he can how he how he can really hit that dopamine without her around. Yeah, I mean, we we begin to explore that towards the end of that first issue um, yeah. when he, uh, without spoiling anything, he completes a sort of rescue mission uh, after having been depleted of his dopamine mm -hmm. uh, because he's sort of um, he's made to feel ashamed uh, of himself, and so. You know, there's this kind of beautiful moment where he's connecting with with the people of the city and the people that he saved, and and that is sort of that becomes a spike in dopamine, that pure joy. Um, and so, yeah, we, we we are definitely going to explore a couple of different behaviors and sort of means by which this character can receive those dopamine spikes, and and also in the inverse, you know, we're going to explore the ways in which this character can feel defeated and therefore physically and mentally and emotionally weak. Um, because, you know, I mean, we talked about it a little bit last time we chatted, but, you know, this story really does concern the performative nature of the male ego and the ways in which we are made to, um, we are made to, I guess, initiate things on behalf of other people for other people. And, and what happens when, you know, you yourself are not steadied, um, what can that do? And so... Yeah, it's um, it's going to be a fun ride. And, you know, as far as his relationship with Issa goes, I mean, she is a very consistent part of the story in this character's life. Mm -hmm. But the context of their relationship certainly does change. Yeah, uh, There's a little bit of drama that gets thrown into the mix. And I think I don't think it's in a way that anybody's really going to suspect. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think we're in for a, a pretty interesting ride because at the end of the day, you know, it's a, it's always going to be a character driven story. That's kind of my approach um, from front end to back end. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm so, um, so Ryan, when it, uh, this is a rise is the first project you've worked on him with, or did you work on minutes of midnight as well? I did a story in minutes of midnight. With okay. That. I thought, so I, I couldn't remember exactly. So um, when he came to you with this project, how did you feel about it jumping into it? Um, I was pretty excited because I've been doing comics for 10 years and I haven't stepped into the superhero genre. Yeah. Um, so that was, I was excited to do that, to try my hand at that. I was also excited at just the, uh, the concept behind it. Cause it wasn't just going to be another superhero story. And superhero has been done to death on every which way possible. And this was an interesting take and a very personal take too. And so I think, um, just hearing about it, I felt like the story would lean into a lot of the strengths I have as an artist and uh, just to us as collaborators. So I was pretty stoked to, to hear about it. So what did you guys, um, how, how did the brainstorming go when you came to designing uh, Rise's costume? You can, you can kind of tackle that if you want. Yeah, I mean, I basically, I created just like a blank like silhouette and then very, very small, just made a bunch of them and then mm -hmm. just did like a bunch of variations. And then I sent those over to, to Trevor and we kind of like picked uh, pieces from what we liked and that's how we came up with the costume. Did you think about going with a different color or anything like that? Or was uh, was red or red and white kind of something you uh, already pinned down that, that was color you, color scheme you wanted to go with? It seemed to kind of be pretty consistent all the way through. Yeah, uh, Trevor sent me an initial sketch that he had actually done that was um, red and white. And we just kind of, picked that, picked how much red, how much white, stuff like that. Yeah, I nice. think a, a lot of yeah. the, a lot of the conversation around color became like mm -hmm. the proportion of what color versus the other. Um, because we are, you know, I I mean we are using the costume as a means to explore some of the metaphors and and the themes of this story. The costume itself actually becomes a, a metaphor for this character and his transformation in many ways. And you'll see um you'll see that in in a big way in issue two. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, like, yeah, so it's, that'll be a lot of fun. And, and you kind of begin to look at the colors in a, in a different light, you know, like white kind of associating with purity, with sort of regality, something a little bit more sort of prestigious. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's all I'll say. The, the, the way, the way that we, we tackle that is going to be interesting and, it, it's kind of fun to be able to try our hand at the the traps and tropes of the comic book uh, or of the superhero comic mm -hmm. uh, 
but in our own way, I think in a, in a fresh way. Yeah. No, and that's what I love about your comics. And I've told you a thousand and one times it's that your comics are, are unique because like, like Ryan is saying, this isn't just your everyday superhero comic because hold on. I had a burp. Sorry. Um, I, I cover a lot of small independent comic creators. Um, I, I've, handfuls and handfuls on on my facebook and i you know I, I go through their comics and some of them they're not necessarily bad comics but they're lacking a sort of substance to it you know because we've seen the superhero thing done before the superhero comes in saves the day beats some people up you know and it's like oh you know, tune in next month and get the next issue where he fights against so and so and that's why I know you were very hesitant to get into superhero comics because you didn't want to create that because there it's the, the market is flooded with exactly that you wanted to create a superhero that wasn't necessarily about his superpowers, but more about the, the human condition about uh, the human experience um, it, specifically, like you said, surrounding the male ego. And that's one of, one of my favorite, you know, I'm a huge movie buff. I mean, we've talked about this before and uh you know, I love movies and cinema and, and any medium that focuses on really targeting those aspects. And that's one thing I, I've really liked so far about this comic. You know, we're just getting the nitty gritty. It's a, just an introduction. And I'm excited to see where you're going to take this. Um, getting to a point, how many issues do you plan on making this? <laughs> it's funny because that number is like constantly changing. Yeah. Um, when we when we first started talking about the end of the book like we were thinking it was going to be three of these oversized issues because these are effectively double the size of your typical yeah when i was going through it it was like 39 pages yeah yeah and then issue two is like 34 nice you know, plus plus back matter so um you know they're 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 thick uh yeah. and so now we're probably thinking in the neighborhood of four to five of those oversized issues you know as far as the pacing went I realized sometimes so little happens in your regular monthly periodical superhero comic. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I kind of have a little bit more bandwidth to really develop uh, some of the emotional circumstances and stakes uh, more thoroughly than I thought I was going to be able to. And that's always a focus of mine, you know, above all. And I also wanted to give the story the breathing room so that we could still do cool superhero shit. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like we have two triple page spreads for the fold out in issue one. Uh, issue two, you know, we've got a cool, a really cool chase scene. We've got a really cool sort of like rescue scene on a, on a larger scale than we've gotten to see this character perform at before. So I wanted to just kind of make sure that I can – develop an organic way to make the next beat impactful right and that yeah. means i've got to take a little bit of time beforehand setting up some stakes and circumstances so i'm thinking probably four or five <laughs> we were just talking about it today funnily enough because um you know the a covers for at least the first three issues have already sort of been broadly designed in the layout stage to connect you know they're a triptych gotcha and so uh we're like i was just apologizing to him funnily enough because i was like <laughs> i actually don't know what the final number of issues is we have an ending like we've we've talked about this ending we know where this story goes it's just a matter of making sure that we get to that final destination and it is satisfying and earned and and that it doesn't feel like it comes out of nowhere because um, very much in the way of Area 51, the Helix Project, I would bet that nobody is going to be able to figure out how this story ends. Yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm really proud of that. And I think it's it comes from a real place. But in order to do that and to have it be a satisfying read, I have to spend the time to make sure that we we lay this the groundwork to make that happen. And that's super important. Um, so yeah, probably four or five of these oversized issues, which is the difference between like 40 extra pages. <laughs> so, um, yeah, welcome to, uh, welcome to my brain. It, it's not very organized. <laughs> you know, this is uh, actually a topic that I've been, um, uh, talking about recently with, um, I know you haven't been keeping up with it, but with the most recent ending of Wolverine, um, they ended on issue number 50, but the last nine, 10 issues 
was all the saber tooth war, which is all fine and dandy, but it didn't need 10 issues to tell the story. Like it got to the point where it was like, okay, this is kind of a filler. Like why, why didn't they just put, you know, make this five or six issues and be able to tell a story. And I, I, I think that really is a testament uh, to, to good writing is being able to tell a story and, and not have to draw it out for 10 issues to get your point across. And um, I, I think I've really come to appreciate that more when, I, when, especially, you know, reading your stuff, you can go from point A to point B in you know, X amount of issues without needing to be like, you know what, I need to add four more issues so that I can extend the story out. Now, if it's necessary, I know you would, but you'd like to keep it uh, as minimal as you can. That way you can actually really get the point across in every single issue and make every single issue count in some way, shape or form versus oh, yeah. versus Wolverine has so many like throwaway issues that you just don't need. And it's it. And this is why I tell people that you really should be picking up indie comics because yeah, Marvel and DC is popular. We love those characters, but like, God damn, there's some good writing in indie comics. And like I've said, you know, I have gave your praise a thousand and one times. You you're one of those writers out there. And then, like I, I've told you before, you find the best work, the best uh, talents to be working on your stuff like Ryan Best. You know, his, his work is absolutely phenomenal in this book. And it's just nice to see that talent out there. And when we have big name publishers that are just putting out shit these days. Well, I mean, uh you know, we appreciate that. And the, the goal is always to kind of push the boundaries and to, to tell stories that have their own identity and are worth being told because of that. You know, that's always the, the foundation. And, you know, as you had alluded to before, like jumping into superheroes was such a, I was so cautious, you mm -hmm. know, making this move. I've, I said it for years. I've said it on your channel mm -hmm. that I did not want to do superheroes, um, at least not like independently, right? Because it's hard to overcompensate for the iconicity and the history of characters that already exist and to do something fresh. And, you know, the irony is, is when I had the sort of early seed for this story, I realized that there was no other way to tell it than to use superheroes. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm grateful to hear that. I'm grateful to hear that these stories are kind of connecting beyond the boundary of being an independent comic versus a big two comic, you know, because we're, we're just looking to tell stories that matter yeah. um, and stories that people remember and connect with and feel something about mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day. So um, no, yeah. Thank you for saying that. No, definitely. Um, and yeah. And Ryan, like your stuff is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I wanted to know when, when it came to this comic specifically uh, for issue one, um, what was your, your favorite, fold or what was your favorite uh panel to to do in this that one guy that one guy yeah <laughs> i was actually just telling him because today was the first day i got to see it in print oh and, really yeah i took my time looked through it but um i think it's is it page three i think that would have, yeah it's like yeah. page three or yeah. four but it's like when he rockets out of the bar in the bottom right hand corner there's a guy who's like falling off his stool and mm. i don't know why that was my favorite thing to draw in the entire, <laughs> the entire book is like I don't know. It just captured the concern that his drink might spill, but also the surprise that he's like falling off his stool. And uh, yeah, I just had a blast with like little stuff like that. That and, yeah, and that's surprising because that uh, you got some amazing work in this, and that, that's uh, <laughs> such a small panel in it. Yeah, yeah, but it's cool because like I think having having a book set in like New York, there's so many characters you can like fill the world with, and just so yeah. much stuff going around that like it's it's you get fun opportunities to play with things like that that make 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 the pages feel a little bit more like lived in and real yeah definitely uh trevor what was your favorite part of uh of writing issue number one getting getting the art back <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. i think i think the the i mean the the result of the the rescue scene mm -hmm. um I really enjoyed. I remember editing it and I was on a train going from Harrogate to London in England after I had done a, a, a festival there. Mm -hmm. And I just remember like, I felt something in my gut going over that part of the story. And I was like, this is, this, this is like a moment. This is a real major touchstone 
for this character and the rest of our journey that we're taking with him. This is something that we're going to reference for the rest of the project, really. Um, and we even touch back on it, you know, at the end of the the first issue where they're, um, you know, they unveil the plans for a statue and you think it's going to be this beautiful moment and he looks up at it in fear and goes, this is a monument to my greatest failure. Yeah. Um, and so that, that really, um, in terms of the writing, I think stuck with me the most. Um, yeah, I would say also just as like a fun thing, I was telling Ryan, I was like, there were two, two moments where I felt kind of like giddy and like childishly excited about writing a superhero comic. One was when we got the character designs back, like when we really solidified them and Ryan did this really great, like it was rendered, but it was like this cool loose sketch and it just had like a lot of life and energy. Mm -hmm. And when, when Matthias gave me the letters and I got to see the, the caption box design for John's internal monologue, because there's something about superhero comics and the graphic element of having their own caption box mm -hmm. that has always stuck with me. Like I remember very, very fondly, like reading Court of Owls when I was like 16, you know, 17. And like you open up and it's just Batman talking and it's this cool freaking caption box with the logo and it's just, it's spot colored. And I don't know, there was something very specific about seeing that for my character uh, that, that really like fired off uh, a, a couple, um, a couple neurons in the brain. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I love that aspect of it. Like, look at these covers. These covers are so dope, bro. Dude, wait. I mean, I think I think I sent you a sneak peek. You did of it, but like Ryan's freaking wraparound cover for issue two. Yeah, banger. Like, banger. <laughs> um. Also, uh, I I love the uh, the name John. Now, it, does it have uh, relevance? at all to john kent or is that just a coincidence it's it's there's a little john kent there's also so there's a lot of influence in this story from a t.s Eliot poem called the love song of j alfred proofrock mm -hmm. um and so I, I had to pick a j name and i was like oh john kent you know <laughs> um but it because that poem i mean there, there are a lot of different interpretations but to me that poem was so much about this this man who's like aging very poorly and he's incredibly insecure and they, you know, uh, T.S. Eliot constantly sort of uses these, um, these visual motifs of like him being like crab, like or insect, like, and like clambering and, and clum clumsy. And it's like this sad figure. And so, um, that poem was, was a really big inspiration for this story and sort of exploring masculinity and like, the ways in which men will view themselves and how those they render them inert, you know, like yeah. there's this repeating line in the poem where, you know, the, the sort of voice of the poem is going to um, these gatherings and he's in the corner like this, like this insect pinned to a wall. And there's this repeating line where he says um, something, something, the woman come and go talking of Michelangelo. And it's like this, this reference to, sort of like the monotony of the conversation, but also like how distant he feels from it. And, and so, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, but we, I named the lead character off of like um, the sort of persona in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And funnily enough, uh, I named, well, you'll get into it in issue two. It's not like really a spoiler. We, I named his father Elliot as nice. it's after like T.S. Elliot who yeah. created the poem. So um, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, no, I, I love I love those small connections that you make, and it's it's definitely like you have to um, talk to you and know you a little bit to to notice those small things that you throw in there. Um, and I love that you you always give a little little nudge, a little homage to to Superman, and it just shows that you actually love this character, you you care about this character, and you want to see him represented in, in the best possible way you can represent him. Um, so I love that. Um, and I also love the way you structured this uh, double panel or double page drawing here. Like it's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Like, like going through it and following through it. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun to go through this and, and really just examine each individual panel and make your way through it. Yeah. We're coming, we're coming to find that our, our collaboration is um, 
developing a lot of weird inverted pages where people run upstairs because we did it in bear market <laughs> business, man. Um, and it's funny. I think I think in bear market that was your idea to invert the page, right? Because I know I was like, let's do a Deluca effect. Yeah, yeah. But I think you had inverted the page, and it's funny because I actually was gonna or give you credit for inverting the page. And I realized the inversion was in the script. Ryan had the great idea to make it more legible and more readable to connect it into a double page spread where that bottom panel feeds into the panel one, which mm -hmm. is traditionally not found at the bottom of the page. So basically I had a dumb idea and Ryan <laughs> figured out how to make it work. I feel, I feel like with a lot of stuff, we just egg each other on. <laughs> Like the, uh, the three page pullout was initially like, oh, what if we did a two page, but you had to turn it. And I was like, oh, what if it's, you know, bigger. You know? <laughs> and I think a lot, a lot of the book is like that where somebody has an idea and then the other person's just like, yes, but more. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually something I was going to ask because I have I've talked to Trevor about this when he comes to, you know, picking individuals that he has uh, writing or uh, drawing and coloring in his book and such and and his process on how he uh, kind of delegates the work on or, you know, lets the artist kind of have some kind of range to do what they want and so on and so forth. And so I want to ask you, Ryan, how do you feel um, working with Trevor? Uh, and how do you feel on your like your freedom to be able to express yourself and be able to draw something and, you know, really come to the table with him and be like, you know, this is something I think that would be impactful. You know, how how does that work for you guys? How's the relationship with that? Yeah, I think I think it's very collaborative. I think yeah. that like um, he's very thoughtful about why he does certain things written in the script. And I try to be like that visually. And if either one of us has like a concern or like it's not meshing. We like talk out the reasoning behind it. And it's not just like, Oh, well, I like it this way. There's, mm -hmm. we, we both think about reasonings on maybe why we position a camera, why we frame something some way. And uh, yeah, it just feels very collaborative. That's awesome. He's like, also, also above all, he's like the check clears. So fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Make money off it. No, I mean, it's, it's one hell of a job. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> let's see uh, i want to keep going a little bit like these are mm, i love that page i love yeah, yeah it's love great how that page turned out yeah it's fantastic it looks it's so just, good just like largely silent you just get to watch the man be a fucking hero like yeah i don't and and also like ryan did such a good job with the framing and like using the assets of like the the window and the flames sort of licking up and around and then obviously like Fabi the way she lit it Mm -hmm. Just like really brought that home. I, I love that piece. No, it looks absolutely phenomenal. Um, speaking of being the hero, we may have mentioned it beforehand, but I want to bring it up again. Um, now this story is, is, is mostly focusing, like we said, on, on more of a human condition and uh human experience, but, um, are we going to see a villain or nemesis or anything of that nature? Or is this going to be strictly um, focused on him? Like, is there anything that could essentially counter his abilities in, yes. this, in this world? Yes. Uh, not in the way that you think. Okay. Okay. Um, mm, I, cause I don't want to give it away. And we start, we start to tease it in issue two. Okay. You def like midway through issue two, um, you start to see you start to see where the threat for for John Prufrock uh, really comes into play, um, and y you obviously kind of begin to see how that might affect his performance as a hero, and uh, his relationships, and pretty much everything about him. Um, so yes, but. It's less like haha -ha, maniacal Lex Luthor. No giant robots. Yeah, no giant <laughs> robots. Um, but there, well, there is an atomic bomb. Um, but <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that for, for you guys to figure out. Yeah, th this, uh, this spread is absolutely phenomenal. Like, I, lo I love the fact that you, you, you uh, Ryan, you use the debris to, to really tell the story as it falls and we get down to the ground like that's absolutely beautifully done yeah i think that was your idea right i think so yeah but like 
you executed in a big bad way. I mean, yeah. it's way better than anything I imagined. <laughs> and then, the fucking cape. Like, let's yeah. just let's just acknowledge that like Ryan Best is like very quickly becoming the cape guy. Right? <laughs> like, look at his. I mean, look at his A covers. Like the look at his look at his wraparound cover for uh, issue two. And then like you look at the way he's playing with it. I mean, in that panel, like in yeah. particular, but also in issue two. I mean, there comes points in issue two. Like we had obviously at that point we had worked on the series together for eight months, nine months. Mm -hmm. I, I I literally get to a point where I was like, blah, 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 metaphor, emotions. I was like, cool cape shit. Get it to <laughs> me. Like, get, you know what I mean? Like, I swear to God, I will end a description with now give me some cool cape shit. <laughs> yeah, it does have like a um like a moon knight cape like a, a cloak and dagger type like feel to the flow of it you know what i mean it's such a cool framing device mm -hmm. it like it it that can do so much like visual storytelling yeah it's like a design cheat code i think i was reading something and adam hughes was talking about when he figured out that he could use wonder woman's lasso to like create designs and like really add some pop to stuff and I kind of feel like that with capes. It's just like a, a free reign to kind of add a little bit extra, do a little bit more, make it look cooler. Yeah, I mean, just this uh, this little panel right here looks dope as hell. Yeah, like, just that, just having that cape right there adds so much to that tiny little panel. You know, it's funny too. Like I should have seen this coming because when we were doing Bear Market, one of the things I was most excited about was it's like one of the later pages it's like a splash image mm -hmm. and somebody's shoelaces are dangling in the wind i was like that's fucking excellent like the physics of that shoelace are doing a lot of work for me right now yeah and i remember like bringing that up to him and it's funny like i should have seen how that would translate into the cape thing but i didn't and uh like the more i, I think about it the more that just like becomes some type of perfect uh comic book cape calculus yeah no you know i'm not i didn't even realize it till now how much a cape really can change the atmosphere uh by panel by panel i mean if you look at each of these individual panels and, and if you imagine not having the cape in these mm -hmm. how how less it would feel you know what i mean yeah yeah edna mode really screwed up with uh, mr incredible <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> definitely like that cape is huge yeah and you don't think much of it. You know, we like to make fun of, oh, he's got a cape, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, like the cape, like like Ryan was saying, it does a lot. Oh, dude, there's there's so much more cape fetish in issue two. It's, <laughs> it's, it's crazy, man. Like, it's, we do it in like crowd scenes. We do it in like this really sort of like private, emotional, conversational scene. Like it's, there's capes. If you like capes, you're going to get it, kids. All right, so uh, when talking about issue number two, um, we're going to be getting into that. Like it, like we said, it is going on Kickstarter Live uh, when this is airing, which is today for the everybody that's going to be watching it, um, which I'm very excited for. Um, what do you have in store when it comes to um, goals and bonuses, all that good stuff? Plenty of capes. Uh, plenty of capes. <laughs> plenty of capes. Of course, uh, really great opportunities to catch up on issue one. There are also bundles for those of you that are collectors. You want variant cover packs. Um, and there are even further bundles if you consider backing in the first two days. We have – so we, we already give you a little bit of a discount for buying, like, all the covers. But then you can get even more of a discount for backing an early bird tier. They're limited by time and by quantity. Um, so you have – up to the first 48 hours uh, max to be able to get in on those. But like I said, sometimes they just sell out fast. Like I think like Ryan's a cover for issue one, the early bird tier sold out like well before the end of day one. So, you know, I always encourage people to make sure that they're keeping an eye out, you know? Um, but we've also got a lot of really great opportunities, like getting an original page of Ryan's inks. I actually just for the first time today, got to see an original page of inks from something that I've worked on because it's never happened before. For the mm -hmm. most part, everyone has uh, worked digitally completely. And like for me to be able to see that in my hands and like hold that 
has been incredible. So you can own a page of original art. You can get a really, really beautiful commission from Ryan. Like he's honestly doing like all the heavy lifting in this scenario because all the cool <laughs> shit is because of him. Um, he's he's also opening up like these beautiful like layered colored Copic commissions as well as inked. And we'll have some examples of them on the Kickstarter page. They're stunning. Like I, I keep telling them like it sucks that I like don't have reliable wall space because I just want to buy all of the things. Like I want to commission all of the things. Um, so yeah, you can get, and, and we're going to have so many different like sort of size options in relation to that to make it affordable for anyone out there that wants a cool Ryan best art commission. Uh, we'll have sketch cards of the lead character rise at a discounted price and they're they're sizable sketch cards they're like five by seven inches yeah, five by seven. they're they're nice. big you know they're not you're not getting a little trading card um in addition to that uh optionality to get the book signed by both me and ryan um these beautiful variant covers as as brian's showing you on the screen um what else do we have in there uh, we're going to have like an exclusive uh, T-shirt to the Kickstarter campaign, as I typically do. Uh, art prints. It's like I, I have nothing really cool to provide. It's all him. Um, <laughs> you can become a producer of the book and get credited as a producer or executive producer, which you know I know Brian has done a couple times over. Uh, and speaking of, you can even get drawn into the book which yep. I think is such an amazing opportunity. And we always do our best to make sure that the cameo roles are like fun and impactful. Like issue one, there are three cameos. One of them is the guy who gets pulled away from uh, the bar so that John can sit next to Issa. <laughs> and another one is the mayor actually. Um, but we try to do that and everything. I mean, like, you know, you, you got to get drawn into uh, time fleeting war immortal, which is a short story in minutes to midnight. And we basically got to make you um, King Harold getting yeah. shot in the eye, which was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Like, yeah. you know? <laughs> so uh, I always kind of try to make sure that the people who get in on that early are the ones that get like fun, like super memorable ways to be included in the book. Um, and not to mention, like, who doesn't want to be a comic book character? Like, isn't yeah. that what we're all after? No, that's absolutely phenomenal. Like that's engraving you in time. You know what I mean? Like even, even if it's not something big or huge or monumental, like, like I told you, like I, I bought a bunch of copies just so I could give them to my kids, you know, and just be like, look, like dad's in a comic book. Like it's, it's a fun thing to, to say and have, and just to show off and be like, look, like I'm in there, you know what I mean? Like, so it's a lot of fun. I, I enjoy that aspect of it. Um, like I said, and your your rewards are usually plentiful. I've seen some reward systems that are that are straight garbage. Um, and yours is great, especially considering the prices that you have marked on all of those things. Like it's it's fair, it's good, especially considering the the amount of art that the artist has to put out, the commissions, so on and so forth. Like it's a lot of stuff that putting on a lot of your shoulders on top of the work that you guys have already done to get this comic out there. Um, yeah. I mean, this is this has been a really unique experience because I've I've never had an artist who's been so willing to get so hands on in helping um, kind of move the needle. You know, that's been that's been a really impactful part of why that first issue was as successful as it was. Um, so you know, that's that's been a real privilege as, as part of our collaboration and a driving force behind why. I mean, this book even exists in the form that it does. Um, but yeah, I mean, we you know we're we're throwing you double you know the length of a typical comic for the same if not less than what you would get on average on kickstarter you know so you know a lot of kickstarter books will charge you 10 15 dollars for a 20 to 22 page book and you're getting about 40 for 10 to 12 mention the the quality yeah i mean it's it's always super high quality print you know i mean ryan got to put his hands on them today and, and you're getting i think like a hundred pound cover stock, 80 pound interior stock, the beautiful triple page spreads. Um, and we always try to do something cool. So for example, in the back of this book, there's a big letters page from the Kickstarter backers. So I always give you the opportunity to have your voice heard, have your questions answered. Um, and then actually in the coming weeks, I'll be sending a behind the scenes edition of issue one digitally with inter interviews with the entire creative team. 
um, which I think is always like a, a fun way to see how the sauce is made. You know, whether yeah. you're a fan or an aspiring creator, I always think like getting to see the bones, you know, of the the whole um, the the whole body is is kind of a, a fun experience. But um, we've also like our our digital copies are dirt cheap. Like you can pick up both issues for ten bucks digitally yeah. and they're stupid high res like and and i'm not that i should be encouraged this but they're so stupid high res that i had like reviewers print them out on their printers so that they could read them in physical form <laughs> before the physical came out and they printed out crystal clear <laughs> they're stupid high you could zoom into those motherfuckers for days so um we don't even we don't even skimp out on that and and there are always like we always have stretch goals and backer goals to upgrade that to a higher level like the reason we're doing the behind the scenes edition is because we reached a stretch goal or a backer goal in the last campaign um and that also enabled us for example to send out early digital copies to everyone mm -hmm. so you know that's another incentive as well uh we we want to reward our audience our readership for the support so we give back at certain milestones so that we can make enough to make something financially feasible. But the reality is, is when we do that, we actually lose a little bit of money when we hit those milestones, right? We're going back because we're upgrading the product. Mm -hmm. You know, you saw it with Helix Project 6, where we made the A cover a wraparound for free. Yeah. Um, and in this particular issue, we have Ryan's really gorgeous wraparound cover that uh, I think it's like if we hit 15K, uh, it's going to get automatically upgraded to spot gloss for free. Nice. Um, and we've got a stretch goal cover inherently by Ryan Shoemate. Uh, and I think if we hit 300 backers, we're going to make that a foil for free. Um, so, you know, it's just our way of saying thank you and, and incentivizing that groundswell of support, because that's the only way that either of us get to do what we do. Um, and, and frankly, like if I can kind of like toot our own horn to do it at the level that we get to do it at, we don't have to compromise. Mm -hmm. We don't have to look at, at some comic book overlord who has to meet some crazy unrealistic schedule and do something we don't want to do or make a, a choice that does not serve the characters of the story or or the the visual aesthetic of the book uh this is a passion project everything we do is a passion project and that support this early on something like the kickstarter is how we can give you the best possible product we can um so you know, uh, if anybody's listening or watching this, I hope you consider checking it out because we're trying to give you as much value as we can, both on on the sort of reading level, right? Like the the emotional uh, connection that you build with these stories, these characters, the cool factor and the dynamicism of having the cool triple page spreads or being inventive with exploring the ways in which a superhero is going to perform his day to day tasks, because otherwise it's just, well, he's Superman, mm. you know, like, why wouldn't this be cake? um and and give you deliver value you know making sure that people feel like they're walking away from this campaign with more than what they paid for because i i'm a fan of comics he's a fan of comics you're a fan of comics i'm still a consumer i still buy comics every single week every single month and you know it's it's not always i mean not always it's really not ever the most e economically friendly way to consume media so you have to make it worth it for the consumer mm -hmm. and because I am a consumer just as much as a creator. I'm always thinking about how I can deliver that for the people that go to bat for me, that try my stories and my, my collaborator stories. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, it's about getting these um, expressions into the hands of the people that want to engage with them. Yeah, definitely. No, I, uh, I agree full heartedly. You guys freaking wreck it out better than uh any independent comic book uh publishing uh house that i have dealt with you guys have uh you've you know pocket watch press has always put out quality stuff and that's what i've appreciated most when it came to your heart now, i don't buy physicals you know I, I always buy digital most of them are crap um and just the the feel of it isn't there anymore and compare then you pick up one of yours and it's just like this is what we're missing you know this is the kind of feel that that people are missing and they want in their physical copies. Um, but now to, to move that past that and uh, give you guys one last thing to, to answer. And uh, this will be to the both of you, uh, Trevor, you can uh, answer first. Um, when it comes to issue number two, what do you want 
fans or, or potential fans to know about issue two that was impactful to you or that that really means something to you message wise i mean issue two is really where the challenge begins for this character you know his character arc um really gets pressed and his is is what's what i'm looking for um integrity gets challenged and i think you know dealing with the themes that we're dealing with as as regards to uh, masculinity i think integrity is always a major part of the conversation and everybody's sort of image of integrity changes and shifts based on where they come from and what they do and so on and so forth um but this issue is where we really start to test this character's resolve uh, not only physically but mentally right in the way that he's solving problems emotionally in the way that he's handling certain things coming his way and these sort of behaviors that are being gratified by mm, his biology, but also mm -hmm. by his social role as a man. Um, this issue is a is a is a quite a contrast from issue one. I think issue one, you know, we, there is danger, there is threat, but it's it's a it's a very loving and, and happy first issue, which I think is actually very uncommon for me. Funnily enough. Um, don't worry, kids. Issue two, we're going back to spiraling depression. <laughs> we're, we're in there, so it's it, it's uh the, the the stakes begin to really um, deepen in that mm -hmm. second book, and I'm really excited because that's where I think the meat of the story really comes from. And then, uh, Ryan, if you want to answer that, maybe from more of an artistic perspective. Man, he kind of covered it all, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I think. I think everything just goes deeper in the second issue. Yeah. I feel like the first issue feels very much like um, like the first movie in a franchise where the character gets challenged, he comes out on top, mm -hmm. happy ending, everything's good to go. Uh, the second one is, yeah, like what Trevor was saying, really when the challenges come in, when all the, all the characters get flushed out more, everyone feels like a little bit more real, a little bit deeper. And then as far as the art goes, like crowds, I, I, crowds, <laughs> yeah, lots of crowds. lots of crowds. <laughs> I feel like everything that's in issue one is in issue two, which is more, more cave, <laughs> more people, more cars, more buildings, everything's just more. So <laughs> I think it'll be good. Oops. <laughs> Love it. it sounds like fun. I'm, I'm excited to get into it. Uh, so if everybody watching, if you want to check this out, you can check it out at the Kickstarter. I will have it linked down in the description. And Trevor, Ryan, you can both, um, if you've got any plugs, anything you want, you know, Pocket Watch Press, all that good stuff, you want to plug yourselves, why don't you go ahead and uh, do that now? You first. Um, read Rise. Uh, <laughs> follow me on Instagram, at Ryan Best Art. That's about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I also say read rise. So that means you have to. Um, <laughs> yeah. Check out the Kickstarter. Consider pledging. If you cannot pledge, please tell somebody about it that you think might be interested. That that grassroots is like we live or die by that. And, um, you know, what, I, what I'd like to do is and, and I'll organize this with Brian off screen is for anybody who's remotely interested. What we'll do is we'll uh, we'll give Brian a link to a digital preview of Rise Issue 1, the first 19 pages because that's how much i believe in it that's how much i think you will enjoy the story if you get a chance to open that up and 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 live with those characters for a minute um you know so just to just to show you that we're we're coming out swinging we're telling a different kind of superhero story and that doesn't mean that we're doing it to be controversial or shocking we're doing it because we feel like this is an untapped area of the genre um and of the the larger zeitgeist and mythology of superheroism and what that means right to us as a as a global society right these figures exist in in like beyond space right you can go to uh, a third world country on the other side of the planet and a little boy will know what a superman symbol means mm -hmm. that says something right what does that iconicity stand for um and and we're we're looking to to push that in in a little bit more I think explicitly human way, but that's always kind of on the forefront. Um, so check this book out and, and at bare minimum, you get half of the first issue for free on us through uh, comic breakdown. But uh, I hope you consider checking it out. I hope you tell a friend 
we're really, really trying to push ourselves to do something special and to, to stand out, um, not because we feel like we need to be seen, but because we have a story to tell and we feel like it matters um, because it does, to be honest with you. And at bare minimum, it's going to look fucking great mm-hmm. and it's going to be wrapped in hella capes. So, <laughs> you know, what more could you ask for? And and Brian, man, thank you so much for having us, man. It's, yeah, a, of course. it's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to do this and shoot the shit. And like, I think the very rare opportunity of having somebody that I have so much rapport with mm-hmm. lets us have like these fun conversations that are all just like toothy smiles and grins and mm-hmm. um, uh, vulgarity, <laughs> you know. So uh, it's I'm so happy to have been here, man. Thanks for taking the time to have us. Yes, thank you. Um, so yes, check out Pocket Watch Press. Check out Rise issue number two. It is in Kickstarter starting today. This is your early bird special opportunity to get in there early. Like you heard, you can check out the the first issue. At least check out the first nineteen pages in the Kickstarter. You'll be able to get issues one and two. So make sure that you guys check them out. Support a good writer. Something that's out of the ordinary. Something that's a little bit different than the the day to day punching a bad guy in the face and waiting till next week to see what happens. Something a little more fun, a little more, a little more of a thinking man's game when it comes to comic books. Uh, So check it out and we will catch you on the flip side.